the degree of spirituality or materiality of the organisms was signified by the quality, beauty, and value of the garments worn. Man's physical body was looked upon as the robe of his spiritual nature. Consequently, the more developed were his super-substantial powers the more glorious his apparel. Of course, clothing was originally worn for ornamentation rather than protection, and such practice still prevails among many primitive peoples. The mysteries caught that man's only lasting adornments were his virtues and worthy characteristics. That he was clothed in his own accomplishments and adorned by his attainments. Thus the white robe was symbolic of purity, the red robe of sacrifice and love, and the blue robe of altruism and integrity. Since the body was said to be the robe of the spirit, mental or moral deformities were depicted as deformities of the body. Considering man's body as the measuring rule of the universe, the philosophers declared that all things resemble in constitution, if not in form, the human body. The Greeks, for example, declared Delphi to be the navel of the earth, for the physical planet was looked upon as a gigantic human being twisted into the form of a ball. In contradistinction to the belief of Christendom that the earth is an inanimate thing, the pagans considered not only the earth but also all the sidereal bodies as individual creatures possessing individual intelligences. They even went so far as to view the various kingdoms of nature as individual entities. The animal kingdom, for example, was looked upon as one being, a composite of all the creatures composing that kingdom. This prototypic beast was a mosaic embodiment of all animal propensities and within its nature the entire animal world existed as the human species exists within the constitution of the prototypic atom. In the same manner, races, nations, tribes, religions, states, communities, and cities were viewed as composite entities, each made up of varying numbers of individual units. Every community has an individuality which is the sum of the individual attitudes of its inhabitants. Every religion is an individual whose body is made up of a hierarchy and vast host of individual worshippers. The organization of any religion represents its physical body, and its individual members as a life making up this organism. Accordingly, religions, races, and communities, like individuals, pass through Shakespeare's seven ages, for the life of man is a standard by which the perpetuity of all things is estimated. According to the secret doctrine, man, through the gradual refinement of his vehicles and the ever-increasing sensitiveness resulting from that refinement, is gradually overcoming the limitations of matter and is disentangling himself from his mortal coil. When humanity has completed its physical evolution, the empty shell of materiality left behind will be used by other life waves as stepping stones to their own liberation. The trend of man's evolutionary growth is ever toward his own essential selfhood. At the point of deepest materialism, therefore, man is at the greatest distance from himself. According to the mystery teachings, not all the spiritual nature of man incarnates in matter. The spirit of man is diagrammatically shown as an equilateral triangle with one point downward. This lower point, which is one-third of the spiritual nature but in comparison to the dignity of the other two is much less than a third, descends into the illusion of material existence for a brief space of time. That which never clothes itself in the sheath of matter is the hermetic anthropos, the overman, analogous to the cyclops or guardian Dion of the Greeks, the angel of Jacob B. Me, and the oversoul of Emerson, that unity, that oversoul, within which every man's particular being is contained and made one with all other. At birth only a third part of the divine nature of man temporarily dissociates itself from its own immortality and takes upon itself the dream of physical birth and existence, animating with his own celestial enthusiasm a vehicle composed of material elements, part of and bound to the material sphere. At death this incarnated part awakens from the dream of physical existence and reunites itself once more with its eternal condition. This periodical descent of spirit into matter is termed the wheel of life and death, and the principles involved are treated at length by the philosophers under the subject of metempsychosis. By initiation into the mysteries and a certain process known as operative theology, this law of birth and death is transcended, and during the course of physical existence that part of the spirit which is asleep in form is awakened without the intervention of death, the inevitable initiator, and is consciously reunited with the anthropos, or the overshadowing substance of itself. 
This is at once the primary purpose and the consummate achievement of the mysteries that man shall become aware of and consciously be reunited with the divine source of himself without tasting of physical dissolution. To inserts the divine tree in man, reverse, from Law's figures of Jacobimi. Just as a diagram representing the front view of man illustrates his divine principles in their regenerated state, so the back view of the same figure sets forth the inferior, or night, condition of the sun. From the sphere of the astral mind a line ascend through the sphere of reason into that of the senses. The sphere of the astral mind and of the senses are filled with stars to signify the nocturnal condition of their natures. In the sphere of reason, the superior and the inferior are reconciled, reason in the mortal man corresponding to illumined understanding in the spiritual man. The divine tree in man, a verse. From Law's figures of Jacobimi. A tree with its roots in the heart rises from the mirror of the deity through the sphere of the understanding to branch forth in the sphere of the senses. The roots and trunk of this tree represent the divine nature of man and may be called his spirituality. The branches of the tree are the separate parts of the divine constitution and may be likened to the individuality. And the leaves, because of their ephemeral nature, correspond to the personality, which partakes of none of the permanence of its divine source. Continued. The Hiramic Legend When Solomon, the beloved of God, builder of the everlasting house, and grand master of the Lodge of Jerusalem, ascended the throne of his father David he consecrated his life to the erection of a temple to God and a palace for the kings of Israel. David's faithful friend, Hiram, king of Tyre, hearing that a son of David sat upon the throne of Israel, sent messages of congratulation and offers of assistance to the new ruler. In his history of the Jews, Josephus mentions that copies of the letters passing between the two kings were then to be seen both at Jerusalem and at Tyre. Despite Hiram's lack of appreciation for the twenty cities of Galilee which Solomon presented to him upon the completion of the temple, the two monarchs remained the best of friends. Both were famous for their wit and wisdom, and when they exchanged letters each devised puzzling questions to test the mental ingenuity of the other. Solomon made an agreement with Hiram of Tyre promising vast amounts of barley, wheat, corn, wine, and oil as wages for the masons and carpenters from Tyre who were to assist the Jews in the erection of the temple. Hiram also supplied cedars and other fine trees, which were made into rafts and floated down the sea to Joppa, whence they were taken inland by Solomon's workmen to the temple site. Because of his great love for Solomon, Hiram of Tyre sent also the Grand Master of the Dionysiac Architects, Chiram Abiff, a widow's son, who had no equal among the craftsmen of the earth. Chiram is described as being a Tyrian by birch, but of Israelitish descent, and a second Bezaleel, honored by his king with the title of father. The Freemason's Pocket Companion published in 1771 describes Chiram as the most cunning, skillful and curious workman that ever lived whose abilities were not confined to building alone, but extended to all kinds of work, whether in gold, silver, brass or iron, whether in linen, tapestry, or embroidery, whether considered as an architect, statuary sick, founder or designer, separately or together, he equally excelled. From his designs, and under his direction, all the rich and splendid furniture of the temple and its several appendages were begun, carried on, and finished. Solomon appointed him, in his absence, to fill the chair, as deputy grand master. And in his presence, senior grand warden, master of work, and general overseer of all artists, as well those whom David had formerly procured from Tyre and Sidon, as those Hiram should now send. Moda Masonic writers differ as to the accuracy of the last sentence. Although an immense amount of labor was involved in its construction, Solomon's temple, in the words of George Oliver was only a small building and very inferior in point of size to some of our churches. The number of buildings contiguous to it and the vast treasure of gold and precious stones used in its construction concentrated a great amount of wealth within the temple area. In the midst of the temple stood the Holy of Holies, sometimes called the Oracle. It was an exact cube, each dimension being twenty cubits, and exemplified the influence of Egyptian symbolism. The buildings of the temple group were ornamented with 1,453 columns of Parian marble, magnificently sculptured, and 2,906 pilasters decorated with capitals. 
there was a broad porch facing the east, and the sanctum sanctorum was upon the west. According